once every three weeks. Once every three weeks. Slow is slow. But this is my diag. Hi, so today I thought I would talk about my specific diagnoses and my treatment plan. And before I get started, I just want to point out that I am not a doctor, but this is my understanding of what my diagnoses are, what they mean, and what my treatment plan is. So my diagnoses are DCIS, which stands for Ductal Carcinoma in C2, and IDC, which stands for Invasive Ductal Carcinoma. So DCIS is actually non-invasive cancer that is still inside the milk duct of the breast. And the reason why it's called non-invasive is because it has not broken out of the milk duct and it has not spread to any of the other breast tissue yet. DCIS in and of itself is not life-threatening, but it has the potential to break out of the milk duct and spread to normal breast tissue. So you're at an increased risk for developing invasive breast cancer later on. And I just wanted to read you something. According to the American Cancer Society, about 60,000 cases of DCIS are diagnosed in the United States each year. That's accounting for about one out of every five new breast cancer cases. So it's common, unfortunately. So in my first mammogram, it was pretty apparent that all throughout my right breast, I had DCIS. The other diagnosis that I have is IDC, or invasive ductal carcinoma. So something else that I'm taking from the American Cancer Society is about 80% of all breast cancers are invasive ductal carcinomas. So invasive means that the cancer has spread outside of the milk duct and into the normal breast tissue. Another thing from the American Cancer Society that is more than 180,000 women in the United States find out they have invasive breast cancer each year. Most of them are diagnosed with invasive ductal carcinoma. Also, about two-thirds of women are 55 and older when they are diagnosed with an invasive breast cancer. And just so you know, men can have breast cancer also. But going back to my diagnosis, the pathology from my first breast biopsy showed that my KI-67 is at 80%. And the KI-67 basically tells you how quickly the cancerous cells are dividing. A score of 10% is considered to be low, 10 to 20% is borderline, and if it's higher than 20%, it's considered high. And my KI-67 was 80%. Also from my first biopsy, they graded it. So the grade is based on how much the cancerous cells look like normal cells. The grade is also used to predict your prognosis and to help figure out what treatments might work best. Grade one means that it's slower growing, less likely to spread. Grade two is somewhere in the middle. And grade three means that it's faster growing and it's more likely to spread. So my tumor was a grade three. My kind of IDC was estrogen positive, which means the cancer feeds off of estrogen. It needs the estrogen to grow, and it's also HER2 positive. HER2 positive cancers tend to grow faster and spread faster, which is obviously not very good, but they are also very responsive to treatments that target the HER2 protein. Just to go a little bit more into detail, I did get genetic testing done and I was actually negative for the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Women with the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are at an increased risk for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, and other kinds of cancers. So since I was negative for the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, the only recommendation that the genetic counselor had was that my daughters start getting mammograms 10 years prior to the age that I was when I received my diagnosis. So I was 33 when I received my diagnosis. So they will need to start getting mammograms when they are 23 years old. So my overall treatment plan is I'm going to be getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which means that I'm getting chemotherapy before surgery, which is Taxol. And then in addition to that, I'll be receiving two targeted therapies, Perceptin and Pergetta. Then after that, I will be getting either a single or a double mastectomy. I actually haven't decided whether it'll be a single or a double yet. In the same surgery as the mastectomy, I am gonna be getting reconstruction. 
And then after that, I will be getting nine more months of the Herceptin, which will also be an infusion through an IV. Probably a few months after the mastectomy and the immediate reconstruction, I will be getting what's called an exchange surgery. Then nine months of the Herceptin, and then once I'm done with the Herceptin, I will be taking an estrogen blocking medication for three to five years. Oh, so I know that sounds like a lot and it is, but let me break it down a little bit. So the reason that I am getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy is because I have DCIS all over my right breast and I also have the mass. So one of the reasons why someone would get neoadjuvant chemotherapy is to shrink down the DCIS or the tumor as much as possible before surgery, which might provide more surgical options. And it's also to optimize the surgeon's ability to clear the margins, so to make sure that they are getting all of the cancerous cells out at the time of surgery. Another reason for getting the chemo is it's possible that the cancer could have spread to other places that maybe it wouldn't be visible by imaging yet. So you're killing any of the cancerous cells that could be in the whole body, not just the breast. So I'm getting three rounds of chemotherapy and one round equals four chemo treatments. So all in all, I'm getting 12 chemotherapy treatments and I'm getting them on a weekly basis. At the same time that I'm getting the Taxol on a weekly basis, every three of those weeks, I will additionally get two targeted therapies, Herceptin and Progetta. Herceptin and Progetta both attack the HER2 protein, and that's the protein that promotes fast growth and spreading. Then when chemotherapy is done, I will get an MRI, and assuming that the MRI shows good results, I will take a month off for my body to recover from the chemotherapy, and then I will get either a single or a double mastectomy. At that same time, I will get reconstructive surgery as well. And basically what that entails is the plastic surgeon and the breast oncology surgeon are in the OR at the same time. And the breast oncology surgeon does the mastectomy. And then the plastic surgeon puts in these things called expanders. And they're basically these tiny little plastic bags that they put where the breast was removed. And then I think it's as soon as just a couple or a few weeks after the mastectomy, I'll have to go into the plastic surgeon's office and she will start filling those expanders with saline on a weekly basis until we get to the size that I want to be. The plastic surgeon so far has told me that it usually takes two to three months for someone to reach the size that they want to be ultimately. And then at that time, they do something called an exchange surgery, which is when they take out the expander and they put in the implant. So after the mastectomy and the immediate reconstruction, I will start nine months of just receiving Herceptin. So Herceptin I was already receiving at the time of chemotherapy, but I'm gonna get an additional nine months of the Herceptin after surgery as well to still attack the HER2 protein. And when I'm getting the Herceptin, it is an infusion, so I will need to be going back to the cancer center once every three weeks for nine more months. After I'm done with the Herceptin, I will then take in pill form three to five years of an estrogen blocking pill. And then believe it or not, that is it. <laughs> so I know it's a big mouthful and I hope that that wasn't too much of an overload, but I just thought it would be really good for me to remember all of this. And I thought it might be helpful for anyone who's maybe at the beginning of this journey to see what my journey is and is going to be like. So I hope all of that makes sense. It's a mouthful, I know, but that's what it is. All right, I'll talk to you in the next one. Bye.